Okay, so it looks like everybody's here. We will get started. Uh, good evening and a warm welcome to HSS Presents, a conversation with Elizabeth Baer. I'm Tiffany Angus. I'm a senior lecturer in creative writing and publishing at this faculty. Uh, we're extremely excited to have Elizabeth Baer with us here tonight to talk about how to survive a literary life. Uh, but first, a tiny bit of housekeeping. Uh, please note that this session will be recorded, but rest assured that if your camera is off, you will not feature in the recording. Uh, at the end of Elizabeth's talk and our conversation, we will give the audience an opportunity to ask questions. If you do have any questions, we ask that you type it into the chat box uh, and post them, and then I'll read the questions aloud to Elizabeth. Uh, so Elizabeth Baer, our, our guest, is the author of dozens of novels, seriously. The woman has written a lot of novels and over 100 short stories. Uh, she's won the Hugo Award, the Sturgeon, the Locust, and the Astounding Award. Needless to say, she lives a literary life, so she's well-placed to talk to all of you about what that's like. Um, so welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you very much. Um, I am thrilled to be here. I'm sorry about the dramatic lighting. My camera seems to be having some struggles with light levels. Um, I'm very pleased to be here. I'm going to be presenting this from the perspective of people who are starting out in their career at the seeking, seeking publication stage. Um, I'm going to talk about things that happen around the time of your debut publication and how that can affect uh, mental health and emotional stability, among other things. And I'm going to talk about sort of continuing career development and strategies for navigating that um, without it becoming destructive. Um, you know, we all know that careers in the arts are famous for being very destructive to the people who have them. There are, you know, stories of addiction, stories of mental health issues, um, people who struggle with anxiety or other disorders to the point where they find it impossible to produce stories about writer's block. Uh, and the reason that happens is because careers in the arts are designed, not even designed, they have, they have evolved in such a manner that the person who is performing, who is creating, who is writing, has extremely little control over the course of their career. Um, I think of it as like being a fisherman. You, you don't know what the catch is going to be. Um, you don't know how any particular work is going to be received. Uh, you don't know how successful anything is going to be. You don't know from one year to the next, how much money you're going to be making. Um, and this uh, triggers a whole set of emotional responses as we try to control our surroundings, as we try to feel safe. Um, and that is coupled with uh, what are known as parasocial relationships which are fan relationships, basically, when there are people who feel like they know you better than they do. When what they really understand is a, a construct or a projection that they've built in their own head um, that may be somewhat factually based or it may just be um, a fantasy relationship. And sometimes navigating these relationships with people who feel like they have an intimate friendship with you when they don't can be extremely fraught and difficult. Either they can feel very entitled or it can be very easy for us as creators operating in the public eye to cause damage we don't intend to cause. Um, so to begin with, uh, if you are at the beginning of your career as a writer, or if you are a student, if you are somebody who is seeking publication, if you are somebody who is looking for an agent, who is working on developing a uh, robust self-publishing business, 
um, I think the single most critical thing that anyone can do is to assemble a community, um, assemble a support structure. This should ideally contain both people who are inside of the industry um, at various levels of uh, levels of professional development. So it's useful to have some friends and colleagues who are further along in their career path than you are, because when something happens and you're like, oh my God, I can't believe this just happened. They'll be like, it happens all the time. Here's how you deal with it. Um, and it's also generous and helpful to find some people who are not quite as far along in their career path as you are um, and do what we refer to as paying it forward. Um, someone teaches me, I teach the next person, they teach the next person. But while doing that, it is essential to remember that my experience of publication as somebody who has been in the industry for 20 years now is going to be extremely different from that of somebody who is seeking, attempting to break in now. All of the things that I did to break in are going to be different from what somebody who is debuting next year have done. Now, some of it may be the same like agent search, or, but everything is online. Um, there are things like uh, Twitter manuscript contests, which were not a thing in 2020, or in 2000 rather, are a thing in 2020, were not a thing in 2000. Um, so having those people who are inside the community is vital. Having people who are outside of the community is equally vital because it is really easy to kind of get into this hot house um, mentality where it seems like everything that's going on in the tiny little publishing community, which is roughly the size of a large high school or a small liberal arts college, is the entire universe and is, you know, like whatever, whatever is the main event in publishing is the main event in the whole world. And it really helps to have some friends who are in IT or medicine or physical trainers or plumbers or because they all have their own industry drama. <laughs> it's, it's nice to be reminded that our industry drama is not the entire world. Um, it is important to remember as an early career writer um, that social media is not just a coffee shop where you hang out with your friends. It is a great networking tool. Uh, when you are not well known, it can seem very private and intimate, but unless you are locking down everything you put on Twitter or whatever, it is always going to be there and anyone can read it. And it being the internet, people will misinterpret it or it will push a button and they will have a reactive experience. And then they will be reacting not to what you said or what you intended to say but to what they felt. Um, so in order to be self-protective on that front, it is, it is wise to remember that you are, you are talking in front of an audience, even if you are not talking to that audience, even if you can't see them. Um, so the very off-color joke you might make to your best friend at three o'clock in the morning is probably not something you want to put on the public internet. Um, it's, it is a good idea in general to attempt a level of professionalism there. Um, so in short, it's good to be aware of boundaries and it's good to make conscious choices about them. Uh, you can curate your relationships without being fake. And by curate, I don't mean social climb. I mean, you don't have to, there is a lot of social pressure to out yourself about everything, to, be, to make yourself extremely vulnerable, to uh, proclaim all of your identities and how you wanna be perceived 
it's okay to keep things private. You don't have to tell everybody about your ugly divorce or, um, you know, your unhappy childhood or anything. You, you get to decide what you want to be public about and that's okay. And the pressure to do otherwise is unhealthy. So it's okay to have boundaries around that. Um, it is always easier to move a boundary out than to move it in. Like once the thing is out there, it's out there. Um, you'd also don't have to have a public opinion about everything. If there's some drama going on, it's okay to take the time to get to the bottom of it, to do the research, to find the receipts, to figure out what's really going on because it always involves a lot of games of telephone and shouting and not everything. I, I realize this is a shocker, but not everything you read on the internet is true. <laughs> um, another thing to remember is that because um, there's this concept in psychology of intermittent reinforcement, which is how gambling works. Um, where basically if you do a thing and most of the time you don't get a reward, but every so often you do get a reward, you will do the thing much more intensely than if you just get the reward anytime you want. If you know you can go to the cabinet and eat a cookie anytime you want because there's cookies in there, then there's not that, oh my God, I have to have or that urge, you know, that, um, but if you only get cookies on very special occasions, then when you get cookies, you think you have to eat all of them and you have to try to arrange more situations where you get cookies. Um, so remind, the, the, the world of a creative career is always going to be um, sort of like, because of that lack of control, you're always gonna have the situation where Rewards come unexpectedly. They may not be related to, or you may not be able to tell exactly what it is that you did to get that reward. So it makes sense uh, as a me means of self-care to set up a reward structure for yourself that is under your control. So you are not reliant on other people nominating you for an award to feel good. What if you can set up your internal reward structure so that oh, well, I finished a short story. I will give myself some kind of a bonus. Um, and that way you can build in much healthier work habits and much healthier emotional habits than if you punish yourself for not achieving goals. Um, it's like dog training. It, it's dog training, but you're training yourself. So reward the behavior you want, ignore the behavior you don't want and avoid setting up a toxic cycle so that your brain stays healthy. Um, it's, this is not a zero sum game. Other people's success does not equate to your failure because nobody on earth ever buys one book. <laughs> I mean, nobody who buys books ever buys. We've all gone to a bookstore, right? What, what happens? You come out with twice as much stuff as you planned, planned on because Bookstores are very good at putting things you might like next to other things you might like. Um, and if you get invested in this idea that, oh my God, this person's success is my failure. If you get really baked into that professional jealousy thing, you're gonna make yourself miserable. You're going to make your friends miserable. You're going to make your family miserable. You're not going to enjoy your job. And frankly, for most people, writing doesn't pay well enough for it to suck. Um, so a, that a self-awareness and choosing to be active rather than reactive are key. Um, another thing to remember, even early on in your career, is that you have more social power than you think you do. We all have imposter syndrome. We all have that feeling that what we say and what we do doesn't matter, but it does we have the ability to make people feel terrible and we have the ability to elevate people and make them feel strong. And ideally, I think 
being conscious about how we use that power will make our community better and less toxic for everyone. So uh, once you have broken in, once you, once you have gotten to the point where your first book is coming out, your second book is coming out, you're, you're you know, a newbie author, you're a debut author, you're probably in a slack with 20 other debut authors and you're all making each other crazy because you're all so anxious about everything. Don't ask me how I know. <laughs> there weren't slacks, but we had uh, AIM chat rooms. <laughs> um, just remember that everybody's having the same feelings that you're having and that that anxiety can create loops and feed off itself. Um, so you want to be mindful of your own career struggles and your own feelings of inadequacy and make sure you don't broadcast those sort of broadband. Again, because you want to curate what you're putting on the internet. You don't necessarily want to show uh, people your vulnerabilities necessarily because there are scammers out there. There are people who will take advantage of you. There are uh, marketing scams. Um, so while you were doing that, uh, you may also be feeling that professional jealousy that I talked about previously, where you have that situation where, um, oh, this other person who sold a book the same year I did is getting a much better cover, is getting more publicity or got a bigger advance. And all I can say to that is keep your eyes on your own paper um, because worrying about what the other guy is getting is just gonna make you miserable. And trust me, there is somebody who is looking at you going, oh my God, why, does that, why is this person getting all of these things that I'm not getting? Um, so uh, when you're dealing with, uh, dealing with social media as a debut author, it is healthiest, I think, and again, this is all my opinion, my experience, and yours may be very different. So please don't think that anything I'm saying here is categorical do's and don'ts. Um, it is healthy to decide in advance what battles you're gonna fight, uh, how you're gonna fight them, why, and what your victory condition is. Um, like wh what the goal of the engagement is. So I feel like anytime you get into an engagement, a public engagement with some controversial topic, you want to know what your goal is. You want to know why you're doing it. Um, and that will keep you from getting into endless flame wars or becoming that guy who sea lions people because you just cannot let the topic go. <laughs> um, and not, not developing a reputation as somebody who's a jerk on the internet is in fact helpful to your career. Um, now, that doesn't mean that when you are confronted with racism or sexism or bigotry, or you encounter a toxic person, you should not talk about it because that's also, because that's silencing, right? So, but when you do decide to talk about those things, know what you want out of it because you are gonna be exposing yourself to pushback when you do that. There is always more internet looking for a place to fall and being brigaded is no fun. Um, so be, being mindful when you're about to get into a situation um, will help when you find yourself in a situation that you didn't intend to get into because something you said was misinterpreted or uh, people with toxic political leanings have decided to make you today's example of how they punish people on the internet. Um, and I realize that this sounds exhausting, uh, but if you just remember that your social media is a professional space, you'll be okay. You just think of it as going to work when you get on Twitter. Um, when you are talking to your friends in private, you do not have to worry about this. Hopefully, if you've you know chosen your friends well. Um, so, also if you're if you're going to uh, 
criticize things on Twitter, um, remember that that can come back and, and bite you. Uh, I'm not saying don't do it. I'm saying that maybe maintain professionalism while you're doing it. I have a friend who got an option offer from a certain well-known uh, to famous, what, what shall we say, uh, um, famous action movie producer uh, who he had spent a great deal of time making fun of on Twitter. And then he had to spend three days going through and purging his Twitter of all of the uncomplimentary references to famous action movie producer who shall remain unnamed, uh, but makes movies about giant robots. Um, <laughs> So uh, let's see. Uh, publication may come as kind of an anticlimax, and that's okay. You you may have built it up into a huge thing in your head, like it's always going to be great, it's going to be amazing, all this stuff is going to happen, and then you realize that by the time your first book comes out, you're halfway through your third book, and worrying about the edits on your second book, and all of this publicity actually seems like kind of annoyance. On the other hand, it's okay, you know, in pandemic, whatever way is currently safe in your pandemic precaution zone to, you know, go out and get cake, take your mom out to dinner, whatever. Like some kind of a celebration is, is a good idea. Um, and you're gonna have to, that's another place where you're gonna have to reward yourself because nobody else is gonna do it. Um, the only time your publisher is going to notice your existence other than publishing your book is if you come back with a, like a Hugo Award nomination or you make the New York Times bestseller list and then they will send you a cheese box and then they will forget you exist again. So, <laughs> um, so make your own fun. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, you will meet people who do not view you as a real person. It's that parasocial relationship thing. Um, they will be, it, it will be a little like dealing with a teenager who has a crush on you. They will expect you to be one thing. And if you are not perfectly that thing, they will become very angry with you. Um, it will never occur to these people that you are a real fragile human being with feelings, family tragedies and bunions. Um, because as far as they're concerned, you're an archetype, you're a construct. Uh, the only, there is no way to deal with these people except for having very good boundaries. Um, I, apparently the, I could have delivered this entire talk in, uh, two sentences, you know, find somebody to teach you how to have really good boundaries and have good boundaries. Um, okay. Uh, the third part, uh, as your career progresses, um, the eyes on your own paper thing remains. You're gonna have good years, you're gonna have bad years. Um, treasure the good years. Remember that the bad years are luck of the draw. Sometimes try not to get superstitious about it. Um, you know, fishermen, uh, sports players and writers are the, and actors are the most suspicious, suspicious, superstitious people on the planet. And it's because of that lack of control of what actually happens. Um, Focus on what you can control, which is the work you do, the way you run your business, the way you run your relationships, um, and the work you do on your own emotional well-being and self-care, and you know how you how you have your family life. Um, the things you can't control are award nominations, bestseller lists, uh, invitations to book festivals, movie deals. None of that under your control. What is under your control is making your work the absolute best you can and whatever you can do to promote it. Um, and I, it is also possible to go way overboard on promoting stuff because getting on Twitter and constantly saying, buy my book, buy my book, buy my book just gets people to mute you. Um, and that's only if they know you well enough that they think you'd notice if they unfollowed you. Uh, so also remember when reviews happen, reviews are not for you. The reader uh, owes you absolutely nothing. And what you owe the reader is just the story you put on the page. You don't owe them anything more than that. They don't get a claim on you. They don't own you. 
you don't get to control their reactions. Do not be that person who gets on Amazon and argues with reviews. It, they're not for you. Um, even if they're, especially if they're wrong. <laughs> um, your income is gonna vary wildly, plan for this. Uh, it's okay to have a day job. There's no, sh most of the writers I know have day jobs or do something else. Um, or have another freelance gig, like editing. Uh, if you have a really good year, it's the best idea is like pay down debt, save some money, that, you know, basic financial advice. Um, the pressure to produce can be enormous uh, from publishers, from fans. Um, it's okay to say no to unreasonable deadlines. It's okay to say no to unreasonable workloads. Again, boundaries. Um, having them is not the same thing as being a diva. Uh, that said, be nice to the people in production. Um, <laughs> it's not going to make you any friends if you get on Twitter and complain about your copy editor or book designer and how awful they are. Um, because all that will do is get you handed down to worse and worse copy editors because the good ones won't want to work with you. Um, you know, again, these are professional relationships and they should be handled professionally, which means that if somebody does a terrible job copy editing in your book, talk to your editor. Or if you are, are self-publishing and you are the person who hired the copy editor, tell them they did a terrible job in private, give them the opportunity to correct it. And if not, don't use them again. Um, and again, this is also not to say if you encounter, encounter somebody who's a raging bigot, you shouldn't say anything about it to anybody. Because of course, if your editor tells you, you know, if, if you are a writer of color and your white editor says something horribly racist to you, of course you should tell their boss about it. <laughs> I mean, you can't go to HR because you're a freelancer, but you do what you can. Um, let's see, I already talked about intermittent reinforcement. All right. Oh, yes. And the last, the last point before we get to the questions is um, remember that offline support system you built way back in step one, you still need them. Um, you're going to find along the way that there are going to be people who suffer professional jealousy about your career and some of them are going to make problems for you um you are going to find that there are people who get very upset that you got a publishing contract and they didn't or that you got a bigger advance than they did or that you got an award and they didn't and all i can say about those people is that that is on them they need to go through that entire process of developing their boundaries and their emotional regulation and understanding what their trigger issues are um, and taking responsibility for the fact that when a good thing happens to somebody else, it's not about them. Um, so you will, need, you will need those friends for those reality checks. You will also need them to tell you when you are being an idiot because we are all idiots sometimes. And having, having a good crew who's like, oh, well, don't put that one on Twitter. No, just don't <laughs> walk away. Um, maybe now is not the best time to have a diva fit at your publisher. Uh, maybe if you're trying to write a comeback book, you don't want to write something super artsy and arcane. Uh, that has a readership of about 12 people. Like having those people and listening to them when they tell you, you know, when they do the real talk thing is important. Um, and it's also important to know that when somebody turns out to not be trustworthy, it is okay to distance yourself from them. And you kind of have to know or learn the difference between the person who is negging you and the person who is telling you that maybe your transition from act two to act three doesn't work. And that's pretty much all I've got. So I think Tiffany, we're, we're ready for questions if that's okay. 
Okay. So um, for a few minutes, um, we're going we're gonna to have a bit of a chat to everybody to ask questions. So you talked a lot about social media, which is a really interesting, um, it, it's, it's huge. You know, we, mm -hmm. we all live our lives online, especially this past year, we've lived our lives online. Um, yeah. And so I have got a couple, uh, a couple things I'd like to, us to, to discuss a little bit that have to do with um, social media and how we put ourselves out there as authors. Um, one thing that's come out a lot, especially the last few years in the publishing industry is about um, representation, you know, mm -hmm. inclusivity, because, um, you know, we want we want more diverse characters out there. But sometimes we as as social media users see how that can lead to uncomfortable situation in regards to certain things such as hashtag own voices, etc. And social media can be a bit of a minefield. So how can a writer, especially a new writer, navigate, I'm going to use bunny ears, cancel culture, uh, especially if considering writing a character of color or one who's LGBTQ plus or one with disabilities, somebody who isn't necessarily, who you don't necessarily represent, you're trying to write um, from, a, from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. That is, I mean, because the alternative is, of course, to only write characters who are exactly like you, which does not help with diversity, it does not help with um, inclusion, it does not help with marginalized creators getting to write anything except quote marginalized literature either. Um, one thing you can do, I think the most important thing to do is if you are going to write about people who are not like you is to make sure that you are writing in areas where you have done significant research, where you have, and obviously you can't do this in historical cultures, but you know, where you have friends, where you, places where you know people, where you have people you trust who can tell you if you are embarrassing yourself. Um, if you do embarrass yourself, you know, fix it. Um, <laughs> There's a, a real a real need for for goodwill and for honest attempts to talk to one another. Um, I think that it is also very important if, for example, I've written some. Uh, novels that are set in a fantasy Asia. I feel, or I shouldn't even say fantasy Asia, fantasy Asia inspired setting that is much like, um, you know, you would say Robin Hobb is not a European setting, but a European inspired setting. I feel that because of that, it is incumbent upon me to really do as much as possible to boost Asian diaspora writers, um, who are also writing in those settings. Um, and actually the, the book that I've just handed in is probably the last one I'm going to do in an Asian setting because there are so many diaspora writers at this point um, that I don't feel I'm creating any inclusivity by writing in that world, writing in that setting. Um, when I started it, the, the original inspiration was a friend of mine uh, who is of um, East Indian extraction complaining to me that she couldn't find characters who looked like her in fantasy. And I said, well, I, you know, that, that is the thing I can fix. Will you help me? Um, and so I did rely on her heavily as a beta reader. Um, I mean, that's another thing, beta readers, sensitivity readers, cultural consultants, um, pay them. <laughs> also pay them or, you know, trade at least trade beta reads if they are also writers. Um, give, give, give value for, you know, what you take. Um, if you are writing in a, in a culture, it doesn't hurt to contribute, uh, you know, a port, if you if you make a profit off of it, um, which of course is always questioned, it doesn't hurt to contribute some portion of that profit to, you know, a charity centered on that. Like if you if you happen to be a straight person and you're writing a, a gay main character, after you do all your research, 
you know, you may also want to give some money to uh, charities that benefit gay youth. Um, that's, that's a really interesting way to be like part of the community to be to, to sort of build your own as well. Yeah, it's it's human decency, and there is there is literally nothing you can do to stop the internet from falling on your head. Um, that is the other the <laughs> other part of the question, you know, because sometimes you will do something dumb and the internet will fall on your head and you'll deserve it. And sometimes the internet will fall on your head because somebody doesn't like you. And there are, as we all know, there are bullies out there who use important, uh, important social movements as tools of bullying because that's the way people are. Um, abusers will find, will use any tool at hand to be abusive. So that's also when it's good to have that offline um, and when I say offline, I mean not on social media. It may be like a Discord group or whatever. It may actually be, technically speaking, online. But to have that non-public support group or group of friends um, so that when Twitter is falling on your head, you can go to your friends and be like, look, I just need somebody to take over my Twitter account for a week and mute a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, yeah, so, so that I don't have to see these messages when I log back on, because when somebody's that's, calling you names, it's like, that's not a that's, that's not an honest engagement. That's not somebody who is there to to create dialogue. That's somebody who's there because they found a socially acceptable way to be abusive. Uh, so while social media can be problematic that way, I mean that's something that I think we've all experienced. Um, we do depend on it, uh, especially as mm -hmm. authors, to and especially now with publishing, a lot of publishing houses, they don't um, they don't have a huge marketing budget. And so they depend upon authors to do a lot of their own PR and marketing. So I'm wondering what advice you have for a writer just starting out on how to approach self-promotion. How, how do you not do buy my book, buy my book, buy my book on Twitter? <laughs> Get your friends to say buy her book. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, that's really the, 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 the most effective way. This is totally utilitarian but the most effective way to promote work is to get together with a whole bunch of your friends in a collective and promote each other's work um and it helps if they're all people whose work you genuinely like uh because that also means that um the people who like their work might also like your work because obviously you have things in common um my uh, my friend and occasional co-author Sarah Monette slash Catherine Addison um, and I, you know, certainly tweet about each other's books. And the reason I tweet about her books is because she's brilliant and I love her and she's a genius. Um, hopefully, she feels the same way about me. But you know, it's <laughs> you know, I'm not being disingenuous. You know, so networking that that is one place where networking really can pay off. Um, there's this idea that that it takes like five encounters with a thing for people to decide to buy it. No. So if you if I say buy my book five times, that's not actually five contacts. That's one, and I'm becoming annoying. But if I say buy my book and you say buy her book, and then I say well buy her book, and you know, it's, um, the the idea is not even to get people to buy the book it's to get them to go look at it and see if they might like it like they just have to know it exists um the single biggest reason per per patrick nielsen hayden you know senior editor at core the single biggest reason anybody buys a book is because they read something else by that author and liked it the second the second biggest reason is because one of their friends walked up to them and said hey read this it's cool um and then everything else that happens in marketing and promotion is like five percent of all of those sales so you know it may take a while to build an audience also that's part of the this first publication thing might be anticlimactic um and that's interesting because that's related to that idea of, of branding. So you said, you know, people will will read a book because they read something else by you and they liked it. And mm -hmm. so, and that, and, and that's one of those messages that a lot of new writers get is you have to figure out what kind of writer you are. You have to be branded. You have to brand yourself. But with with social media, I mean, 
do we do we need to brand ourselves as X sort of author? Does social media make that easier or more difficult? You know, what's your take on that? There are upsides and downsides to branding yourself as a particular sort of author. Um, the upside is that you, if especially if you find a niche um, and a broad readership and you find a, uh, if the, the brand you're pushing clicks, um, then you're going to do great, for, at least for a little while. You know, people are going to be like, oh, you know, if, if people, people think horror, they, um, they think, you know, Dean Koontz. Unfortunately, when horror falls out of favor, when people think Dean Koontz, they think horror. So, <laughs> um, so that's the downside to having a really specific brand. Um, and I've seen this happen to a lot of like the hot things over the course of the you know last 20 years I've been in the genre. Um, like the, the urban fantasy wave and the steampunk wave. And so that's, um, so that's, I don't know, that there are upsides and downsides, I guess, to having a really strong brand. Um, also, the question is, is the author the brand or is the series the brand? Because you look at like George Martin, who's somebody who's wildly successful after, who's been in the business literally as long as I've been alive, um, and only became wildly successful, you know, in the late 90s. Um, but his brand is A Song of Ice and Fire, or actually his brand now is A Game of Thrones. Um, his brand is not George Martin. Like all of his earlier work is still not selling um, the way I'm sure he would like. Uh, so you, and God forbid he try to do anything that's not a song of ice and fire. The internet explodes in outrage <laughs> and fury. So that's, that's the downside to branding. <laughs> And you can't always control your brand. Like you can't decide which book of yours is going to hit big. You know, that's that's the thing is you can try, oh, well, I published this thing and it didn't do so well. Okay, I'm going to publish this other thing that didn't do so well. I'm going to publish this thing. Oh, it's doing pretty well. I'll do another one like that. Well, that one didn't do so well. Meanwhile, that second book back there has been discovered by the right audience and is blowing up all out of proportion and everybody wants a sequel. It's the, the Thomas Harris Silence of the Lambs thing, right? Oh my God, 10 years later, I've got to go back and write a Hannibal book got to yeah. terrible buckets of money dump trucks of money <laughs> the horror but <laughs> um you know it, it it's like surfing you just gotta wait for the big one and then hope you catch it right um yeah, yeah there's it's, so it's interesting so little, go ahead i'm sorry i was just <laughs> so gonna little... reiterate that there's so little control there really isn't. And so it's interesting you just you mentioned um, George R. R. Martin and you know if he doesn't write the next book everything falls on his head like the internet falls on his head. Mm -hmm. um, our first question from the audience is Jillian and she says, uh, "Any suggestions for remaining productive when the internet is falling on your head? What tough things are <laughs> happening in real life? Turn the internet off. <laughs> <laughs> Turn it off. Get get that friend to." to mute everybody who says something mean in your Twitter thread and then never think about them again. Um, I got, I mean, I was totally much less productive last year than I wanted to be with the world being the world. Um, I was a year overdue on the book I just handed in, you know, so. Oops. Uh, yeah, oops. Sorry. <laughs> um, well, my ride. I don't know if you can hear that or not. There's sirens in the background. Um, so dealing with that, um, again, boundaries, compartmentalization, uh, therapy. Therapy helps. Yeah, I mean, if you have a good therapist, if you have a bad therapist, then it's worse than nothing. But um, when like the, the big, one of my biggest struggles actually was when my mom got really sick and had to be hospitalized for a while. And it was extremely hard to write. I, I didn't. Um, and I think we also have to accept that that's okay, that sometimes the world blows up and you can't do anything about it. And 
being creative when things are terrible is really, really hard. And it's okay to be gentle with yourself. And if you are, you know, traditionally published, it's okay to um, have your agent call up your editor and say, hey, look, you know, their dad just died. Can I get a six month extension on this book? And usually, usually editors will be very good about that. <laughs> Um, I can only imagine how many of those um, emails happened this past year, really. Uh, from from what I hear a lot. Yeah, I, I think I know one writer friend who actually was productive this year, but the rest of us were like, it was gone. So yeah, we'll see what happens. Yeah. Um, only so, so much Claire asks, so, so much, I'm sorry. Claire asks, uh, what marketing did? What marketing thing did you do that surprised you with how effective it was? You might not even have intended for it to be a marketing activity at the time. Weirdly enough, I think the most effective marketing strategy I have is pets. It's cat pictures and horse pictures and dog pictures. Like that's this is really why people come to my Instagram. And occasionally I hit them with a book picture, you know, <laughs> like. It's like ninety-seven percent cats, three percent books, and oh yes, and bread pictures. Yeah, a few of those too. But and, you know, I I think, but that's part of like the curating thing, right? You can be yourself on the internet, um, but be the your be the yourself you would take to work, and yeah. and create those relationships and create that sense of of being a real person. And it's, it's this weird dichotomy where you're trying to create this image of yourself as a real person in the minds of, in the context of a parasocial relationship in which you are automatically not a real person. It's very, it's very T and no T simultaneously sort of thing. It's, and I mean, that's one of the things that I, I tell my, my writing students, you know, you don't want to wait until your book comes out or your story comes out to suddenly have social media going. You want mm -hmm. to be, you need to be a person on there. If you're a knitter or if you have some other nerdery, you know, you, you post garden pictures or like the bread you made or whatever soup you made. And you mm -hmm. have that where people get to know you that way. So you're a person before you're a writer instead of trying to go the other yeah. direction. I think that works. Yeah. And there's some people who do those like very successful aspirational lifestyle blogs, you know, where it's all photos of their photos of fancy cafes with dark wood and crystal. And <laughs> that's not me. I'm, I'm lucky I've got shoes on, you know, <laughs> sometimes Especially I don't. this year, this year, everything from the desk down in everybody's house is just carnage from here up. I look very professional. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm wearing bright red uh fleece slippers don't tell <laughs> i won't tell nobody knows that. that's um, my so brand <laughs> amber, <laughs> amber has a question she asks how much of your income would you say comes from foreign rights as compared to domestic Ooh. that is an excellent question um for me actually not very much of my income comes from foreign rights um there are a couple of reasons for that um one is that the kind of stuff I write uh, often has a lot of queer content and that makes it a tougher sell in a lot of countries. Um, also female and you know, non-binary authors have a harder time selling in many countries. Um, but uh, I'm big in Japan, so <laughs> um, Japanese rights do pretty well. I would say like separates taken as a whole, if you include uh, audiobooks and um, movie options and things like that, that's probably about 30% of my income. Um, the rest of it is either um, prints or reprints. I, get, I'm, I, am, I am not considering uh, the UK and America as foreign rights in, in this case, even though they are two separate territories. So if a book is published in the US and the UK, I get paid twice for it. But because there's no translation and um, I mean, if I, were, if I were considering the UK as, as foreign rights, it would be closer to 
fifty percent of my income. Okay. So. Oh. It's a business question. Yeah. Um, no, it's a good question. Yeah, it's a great question. Mira um, asks, how do you prepare for success, especially in a book to be a series? Ah, oh, so if you have a, if you have a book that uh, accidentally becomes wildly successful and you decide that, and you intended it to be a standalone, but then you want to write some more, um, I may be the wrong person to, to answer that one because I keep screwing this one up. Like I, I, I often joke that if I had, if, if I had just been able to continue ruining Jenny Casey's life, I would probably be, you know, making like, I don't know, um, uh, oh, what's a, what's a, what's a solid, solid selling mid list. I'd probably be making like Marco Cluse money at this point. But, but I couldn't, I couldn't ruin her life again. So, <laughs> um, so that's a, that's a trilogy. And I got out, shame on me. Um, fa failure of the mercenary motive. But I mean, one thing you can do is leave plot hooks. Like don't tie up everything too neatly. Um, or think about leave, leave space for the world to grow, leave roads leading off the picture so that there are directions you can explore in if you there's there's a tendency in many early career writers to tie everything up too neatly and i am totally in this club like it's hard to get enough when you're starting off it's hard to hold a whole book in your head and so it's hard to get enough stuff that is not immediately relevant to the plot into the book that there are other little hooks to hang stuff off of um so i would say that when you're when you're writing that first book if you think of something neat throw it in even if you're not going to use it immediately don't be too disciplined just disciplined enough just enough just enough um, so <laughs> just the, the smidge of discipline um <laughs> so that brings me so as a writer and and even though you're like astoundingly pro prolific um i i can guess you've probably had days where you've picked stared at the blank page and gone, I don't even know what to do. You've had maybe, maybe don't call it writer's block, but we tend to use that term for that, mm -hmm. that existential crisis that overcomes all writers. How do you deal with that if that happens, if when that happens to you? So I've, I've adopted, I mean, that was basically 2020 in a nutshell. Like I would sit down to write and there would be just nothing except, oh my God, what's going on now, you know? Um, maybe maybe i better check the washington post one more time stop get off twitter get off twitter uh, <laughs> um removing distractions really helps like if you don't give yourself anything else to do and you are a storytelling person your brain will get bored and start telling you stories so sometimes just going outside away from the wi-fi uh you know uh neil gaiman famously has a gazebo in the backyard with no wi-fi <laughs> so, jealous. so jealous of that gazebo everybody needs that gazebo. i think chuck wendig has a writer's shack too and i think i think uh delilah dawson is the latest person on the writer's shack um what what i do is i go out on the porch with a notebook and a pen oh. and okay so then no phone it, oh, this, this have, doesn't like, work not... in january yeah this doesn't work in january <laughs> <laughs> but, um but there's you know there's there's no twitter on a notebook so um I have to write. And uh, oh, I still battle with imposter syndrome. <laughs> yeah. That's um, sorry. That's, I just that's both, that. both that's both good to know and kind of terrifying at the same time. I think everybody, but... everybody does. Everybody does. No, you just kind of have to. That's that's why you give yourself the cookies for good behavior. Um, you know, you you reward you reward the behavior you want. So, so anyway, to get to finish the writer's block question, um, I also adopted um, uh, Mary Robinette Kowal's uh, three sentences thing, which other um, other writers I know do like a hundred words. I have to write a hundred words. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter what they are. They can be terrible. It, uh, I have to write three sentences. And sometimes you get to the end of the three sentences and then you think of the next sentence and the next thing you know, you've written 10 pages. 
And sometimes you get to the end of the three sentences and you've been there for four hours and you're like, I'm done. That's it. That was the day. I mean, another thing is to not push yourself. This is super important for mental health, not push yourself to work too much. Like there's this thing people get on, people get on the Twitter. So they're like, I only wrote 2000 words today. I am the worst human ever. And I'm like, not only are you making yourself feel bad, you're making everybody else feel bad. <laughs> um, so, so maybe, you know, don't, don't judge yourself in that, like figure out what a comfortable work day is and make that your goal. And if your comfortable work day is two pages then two pages is fine. Um, and if you get four pages, brilliant. And if you get three sentences, well, you did the bare minimum and now you can go have a chocolate donut. Um, if you can eat chocolate and wheat, if not, you can't have a chocolate donut. <laughs> you can have something else. Um, Insert chocolate donut replacement here. Yes, insert donut replacement here. A a gluten-free, non-chocolate, sugar-free donut. (laughs) (laughs) Which I think is a, a, I don't even know what it is. Um, An almond cookie or something. Uh, I'm digressing wildly. So uh, (laughs) I lost, I completely lost track of where I was because I amused myself so much with the donuts. That's okay. And, and, you know, we're, we're getting close to the end. So I think, I think the donut thing was a nice way to end the writer's block um, <laughs> question. I feel but like to, people are disappointed in my answer here. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's so, so to end, we've talked a lot about, oh, we've talked about social media and about, you know, dealing with mental health issues and, and we don't want to leave this on a negative note. We want to end this on a positive note um, because we don't want it to sound like being a writer is this dangerous thing and writing no. the writing world's full to strife, you know? So what would you say, Elizabeth Bear, for you, are the best things about being a writer? I mean, I used to say it was getting to work in my pajamas on the couch, but now everybody who has a sit-down job gets to work in their pajamas on the couch. Um, but I mean, I the best thing for me about being a writer is that I get to tell people stories and sometimes make their day better or make them think about something in a new way. Um, And I also get to have like my own philosophical arguments on paper. Um, Oh, okay. Um, So like when I I write a book when I don't know what I think about something. So I I write it to have that argument. Um, And just to to briefly circle back to the um, imposter syndrome thing, um, remember that everybody else mostly feels the same way and that insecurity is normal and that self-criticism is normal and that reasonable self-criticism is how you improve and setting reasonable goals for yourself is much healthier in the long run than setting huge stretch goals that you can't you know, that, that are going to exhaust you to attain. This is why like NaNoWriMo is like, can be kind of a sketchy thing for some writers um, because it can exhaust. Yeah, it's totally bad for me. I can't, I keep trying to do it. And then it, I regret it every time. I, I last like three days and then I'm just overwhelmed and I just stop. So, yeah. Yeah. So, and nobody can do, nobody can do more than about nobody I say, but the, generally speaking, people can't do more than three or four hours of really concerted mental activity in a given day. Like you can't be creative for 12 hours straight. And there's the cognitive exhaustion is a real thing. Um, So when you push yourself and are like, oh, well, you know, well, Piers Anthony writes, you know, eight hours a day every day and writes four books a year. I'm like, well, I am not Piers Anthony. not most Plus, of us did, did like, Anthony know. have to do the dishes you know <laughs> I don't know I, I don't know if he does the dishes or not but um I do so does my spouse we take turns uh but um yeah just it's okay to be gentle with yourself it's okay to have boundaries it's um it's okay to like what you do I think is is huge you know you don't have to oh god and don't believe everything that you read in uh how to write books because all any how to write book will tell you is how that particular author solved one particular problem and you you have to find your own process and honor it and not 
try to, the worst I ever broke myself was trying to follow um, all of the advice on how, how you're supposed to write when you're a professional writer. I was a year late on that book because I broke myself. <laughs> So if you have a system that works, stick with it and don't be afraid to experiment and try new things, but don't feel like you have to do anything in a particular way. That, that sounds like a great message to, to end on, you know, that, that idea of figuring out what, what works for you, figuring yeah. out how, how you work best. And you, you've shared some amazing advice tonight. Thank you so much. I hope uh, all of our viewers are, you know, feeling very energized and think, okay, I can do this, but I don't have to be you know, I don't have to be miserable doing it, basically. There's a lot of, there's a lot of good about it. So thank you so much, Elizabeth Bear. It's been wonderful talking to you tonight. And um, we, the, the chat's going crazy with everybody thanking you as well. Uh, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Remember, this will be recorded. So if you want to go back and watch it again, that's great. Everybody give Elizabeth a round of applause. I'm going to do this all by myself. Thank you very much. Can I, can I give you guys uh, and, a round of applause? You guys, yeah, you were all everybody. fantastic. Thank you so much, everybody. <laughs> Thank you so much. Good night. Good night.